Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kurt, and welcome to my backyard. No, not really. This is Stellarium. Uh, this is a astronomical planetarium software that I'd like to feature today. I figure it, it's been a while since I've featured any astronomy-related software like uh, Celestia, Space Engine, Universe Sandbox, stuff like that I have done in the past. Um, so I figured this is a great time because there's a lot of interesting things happening in the night sky. If you've been following me on Twitter or Facebook, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but I wanted to feature Stellarium because it's, first of all, it's free, open source. Uh, it's available for all the major operating systems, Windows, Mac, Linux. Uh, and the link is actually in the video description, stellarium.org, where you can get it for yourself. Uh, but it's very easy to use. It's a little bit easier and more accessible than, say, some of the more... Uh, fully featured or professional, quote-unquote professional, sky chart software like Starry Night or Sky Tools Pro. Uh, so I want to give a brief introduction to the software here today, and then I want to show you guys what's going on in the night sky in the next couple nights uh, that you guys will be very interested in. And then, uh, and then we'll just go from there. Uh, but yeah, Stellarium here. Uh, I'm using the most current version, 0.11.1. Uh, is uh, what's known as a planetarium software. It simulates the night sky and all the objects and stars in the night sky at any given time and at any given point on Earth. Uh, actually, you can also do it from other planets and the moon and things like that, but we're not going to worry about that. We're just worried about what we can actually see outside tonight. Uh, it's uh, I'm just clicking around with the left mouse, looking up and down. You can zoom in and out with the scroll wheel. Get some really weird fisheye lens effect. Or you can zoom in. Let me go to... Where'd the moon go? Come back, moon. Go to the moon. I can center on it and zoom in as if I'm looking at it with a telescope. Everything's very accurate in terms of the sizes and the relationship and the brightness. Uh, so that's that's what's happening uh, actually tonight. This is tonight's sky. Uh, down here on the bottom and on the left we have our, our menus. And here's the time control. Uh, if I wanted to look at what's in the, the sky right now, currently, as I'm recording at 2 p.m. on Sunday, February 26, 2012, 2012. Uh, I click on this little button, and boosh! Uh, the moon is up. I can see the moon during the daytime, but obviously the sun is up also, so we lost all the stars. Uh, another fun fact, you can actually see Venus in the night sky, or in the daytime sky, to be quite honest with you. Uh, if you look hard enough, it's a little bit difficult, but it's, it's bright enough uh, in terms of its magnitude that uh, you can see it during the daytime. It's a little bit easier to spot when it's close to the moon like it is. Uh, but yeah, fun fact of the day. Uh, but yeah, here we go. Let me get into the nighttime now, actually. And actually, uh, come on, fast forward. As you can see, as, as the, the Earth rotates, the sun starts to set. Uh, this program has some really neat special effects that really simulate the night sky and, and effects like that. Um, let me pause right there. Uh, it's 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 really realistic and actually quite a little bit on the beautiful side, whereas opposed to like I was talking about Starry Night or Sky Tools Pro, uh, those are more about being scientific, about star charts and being okay. This is the specific size of this star. I'm not going to add any twinkle or or light pollution or things to that. So uh, Stellarium is a little bit more fancy in that regard. But uh, yeah, like I was saying, tonight, Sunday, February 26, 2012. Uh, we have what's known as a kind of a relative conjunction of planets in the night sky. Just after sunset, I just made it sunset here, it is local time just about 7 o'clock p.m. It's uh, almost 19, 1900. Uh, just after the sun sets, if you look and if you have, an, uh, you know, you're free of you know, obstructions on your western horizon, let me actually turn on... Boo, boo, boo. Where are my cardinal points? There we go, the western horizon. Just after the sun sets, you could see Mercury. And making this easier, let me turn on the labels. Uh, you can see Mercury just after the sun sets. You can also, a little bit further up than that, see Venus. A little bit further up than that, right next to the moon tonight, is going to be Jupiter. And actually, last night, uh, I got a lot of tweets and Facebook messages asking me this. If I look at... Oh, here it is open up the date and time window and go back to last night at the same time the moon was much closer to Venus uh, so a lot of people were asking me oh what's closer to the moon right now Venus or Jupiter well it was Venus uh, but as the moon orbits the earth once per month about roughly uh, tonight the moon is gonna be closer to Jupiter and actually it was funny on Twitter uh, I'm following Cal Penn 
uh, who's the actor who's in those Harold and Kumar movies, uh, he asked, he's like, are any astronomers following me that can let me know which planet is which up in the night sky? So what I did is I fired up Stellarium, took a screenshot, pretty much just like this, but it was last night, so it looked like this, uh, sent it to him, and then he ended up getting it, and he retweeted, and he's like, thanks, cool. So hooray for Twitter, allowing you to converse with celebrities and whatnot. <laughs> so there was, so that happened. Um, what else is going on? Let me get back to tonight. Uh, so yeah, if any of you, uh, hopefully it's not too late, uh, this is the way the night sky is going to look for the next couple weeks or so. Obviously, uh, into Monday and Tuesday, the moon's going to keep moving, but uh, the, the three planets just after sunset are going to be easy to, easy to see. Uh, but, but yeah, if you look out tonight, you got clear skies, go ahead and check this out. The thing I really like about these conjunctions is, obviously you see Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, actually Uranus is somewhere in there too. There it is. Not visible to the naked eye, but it's there. Uh, you can start to imagine... Let me turn off uh, all these these things and deselect that. But these are the planets, and obviously the Sun is right down here. You can start to imagine that kind of horizontal plane at which all the planets orbit the Sun. The orbital plane, as you will. Uh, it's not a perfect line because we're all a little bit skewed and wobbly. Uh, but you can start to imagine that and it's much more effective than looking at it with the software. This is obviously a 2D representation, but you can start to imagine kind of the three-dimensional plane at which the Earth is orbiting the Sun at 100,000 kilometers per second, or per hour. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of a cool way to kind of feel part of the cosmos. Uh, so I really like these kind of conjunctions. Uh, but yeah, that's what's going up tonight. Uh, let me give a brief uh, kind of a tour of the software, Stellarium. Uh, let me fast forward a little bit so we can get a little bit better of a night sky. There we go. This is about 8 p.m. local time. Uh, obviously, I am, if we go into the location window, ooh, ooh. Uh, I am in Chicago. Ooh, I actually I accidentally clicked off of that the first time. I'm in Chicago, and it's really easy. You can choose. You can just search for a selected city, or you can enter in your specific latitude and longitude and altitude, and it'll put you there. Uh, obviously, I'm looking at the northern hemisphere here. Uh, if you are in in Australia, if, if you're Gleason 9, obviously it's daytime in Australia right now, uh, but you can look at the southern hemisphere. Here we go, I'm going to go down to uh, uh, Southern America. You can look at the what's up in the southern hemisphere. You've got the the, mal bleh, the large and the small lat malogenic clouds. Bleh, something I've never seen, <laughs> and a lot of these stars and constellations I've never seen. Uh, but for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to stick with what I know in Chicago here. Uh, so yeah, that, that's the way you can kind of switch your location. Uh, another thing you can do, come on, there we go, obviously the date and time window, is you can adjust your what you see in the night sky. Um, right now I have light pollution set to number four. This is honestly about what I get in the dark site of my astronomy club, which is about two hours away from downtown Chicago. Of course, up into the north and east, there's actually a good portion of the sky is blocked out by the, by the light dome from Chicago, all that light pollution. Uh, but if I was to be actually in Chicago, no way we could see the Milky Way. Uh, and I don't even think this... Whoa, stuff's freaking out here. Oh, that's the twinkle, not the light pollution. Yeah, you can adjust the, the twinkle in the stars. Obviously, you don't need to have that, but that's one of the fancy... One of the fancy uh, little things they do to make it more realistic for you. Uh, here we go, the light pollution I wanted to figure out. If I pump up the light pollution, uh, even this is far better than what you could see from downtown Chicago. From Chicago, maybe you can see Sirius, a bright star, uh, and the moon and planets. That's it. Uh, the light pollution, let alone the skyscrapers blocking your view, uh, are far far too, too much for, for what you can see. Uh, from where I live, out in the suburbs, ah, I keep changing the twinkle. Out in the suburbs, maybe if I'm lucky, this is what I can see. Uh, they're being very generous and showing a little bit of the Milky Way. I can't see any of the Milky Way from the suburbs of Chicago. And like I said, from the dark site in Illinois, this is probably the best skies you're going to see in Illinois. Uh, out in New Mexico or Arizona. This is probably what you're going to see. So, as you can see, light pollution makes a huge difference on what you can see in the sky. Uh, so, keep those lights shielded and turn off those exterior lights if you don't need them. Uh, 
So yeah, I'm gonna keep it like this, just being a little bit generous, it looks a little bit better. You can turn on and off the different uh, labels. I have the nebulas off, but I can turn on the nebulas. And then with these sliders, you can show more. Look at all these things you can look at with your telescope. And then you can show less. Uh, same thing with the stars. You don't need to put the names on all the stars and the planets. There's only so many planets you can, you can show. Uh, your markings, uh, which a lot of these are actually available via the, the quick buttons down here, and also there's keyboard shortcuts, but the markings, uh, we can show our constellation lines, we can show our constellation names, obviously we got Orion there, Taurus, uh, we got uh, Leo over here, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, and the Little Dipper, Ursa Minor, and then you can also show, in terms of, uh, well, in terms of astronomy, this really doesn't matter, uh, this is just the, you know, the folklore behind the constellations. Uh, but in terms of astronomy, what does matter is actually these boundaries. Uh, when you're looking at astronomy and you want to say, where are we at here? Do, do, do. Let me turn on the planet labels so I know what I'm looking at. Okay, we want to say, okay, Jupiter is in Aries right now. Well, that doesn't mean that it's actually within Aries as a small constellation. Uh, but astronomers have kind of created these boundaries for each of the constellations, almost like, you know, countries on a map or states on a map to make it easier to look at things in the night sky and find things in the night sky. So uh, when an astronomer refers to constellations, we're in no way endorsing uh, astrology or any of that bubkiss nonsense. Uh, we're just referring to these different ways that we block out the sky for to make it easier to find objects and things. Uh, so let me, let me turn that stuff off because uh, it, it starts to clutter up the view here. Let me keep it like that. Uh, you can change the landscapes in Stellarium to different landscapes. I choose this one because uh, our dark site with the Astronomy Club is kind of out in a farm field like this. Uh, and also it's very unobstructed. Uh, say if you're surrounded by trees, this is going to be your limited view of the sky. So you're not even going to bother with anything down near the horizon. Uh, if you're on Saturn, <laughs> you're just going to be in the milky haze of Saturn. There's nowhere to actually stand on Saturn. Or you could be on the moon. See what the stars look like on the moon. Uh, but we're going to stick around with this one right now. You can also load in your own landscape. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. I was thinking it'd be really cool to add, you know, I do the panoramics in uh, in Minecraft. It'd be cool to add, like, the Mindcrack server panoramic with the observatory I'm building there. That'd be something cool. So maybe in the future. Uh, but that's really cool. And, of course, you can switch your star lore. We're obviously very much focused on the western, the current western constellations, but all the different... Uh, uh, um, what am I looking for? Civilizations throughout time have created different constellations in the sky, whether they be the Egyptians or uh, you know the Navajo or Norse mythology and things like that. So uh, that just goes to prove once again that our current our current understanding of the constellations make no difference in terms of astrology and things like that. So uh, that's something cool. We're going to stick with the Western because that's what we're familiar with. Uh, but yeah, I'm not. There's so much more to this software I'm not touching on right now. You can even, uh, if you have a computerized telescope, you can hook this up to your telescope and control your telescope with it. So say you have your telescope running over there, you can say, okay, let's go look at uh, the Orion Nebula. Uh, whenever you have that plug-in installed, you can say, go to, and then the telescope will automatically slew to the where you want to look, and voila, you're there. Uh, that's convenient, but uh, I know I get this question a lot about people wanting their first telescopes. I would not recommend you get a complicated computerized telescope like that as your first telescope because you're just going to get frustrated uh, because first of all you don't know the night sky, uh, second of all you're going to be taking two hours to set up and tear down this thing every night so you're going to lose interest in astronomy quicker than if you were just to get a basic alt as up down left right telescope that helps you learn the night sky. Uh, that's just my two cents. Uh, some people prefer not liking to learn the night sky and just plugging into a computer and showing them where they go. Uh, also, those things are expensive as hell, so keep that in mind. Uh, but yeah, that's my two cents on that. Uh, let me look around here. Uh, like I said, tonight, the moon... Uh, Mercury just set, but the moon, Venus, and Jupiter are going to be easy to look up in the night sky, so... Go out Sunday night, impress your friends, tell them you want to look at some planets in the night sky with your naked eye. Uh, if you do have a telescope or binoculars and you want to look at Jupiter, uh, we can zoom in here and... Uh, this is the 26th. Uh, we can actually see, these are the moons we can see tonight. At my Chicago time, this is 8.05 p.m. 
Uh, see the four Galilean moons there that you'll be able to see. Through my telescope, this is probably the view you get. Uh, if I pump up the volume, the volume, the, the magnification, pump up the volume. No, pump up the magnification, it'll kind of look like this, but really the atmosphere makes things really hazy and a little bit more difficult to see. Uh, through binoculars, you're probably going to see this. Um, and as you can see, as I deselected it, I'm no longer tracking it, so it's slowly moving through the night sky. The moon, obviously, is an easy thing to find and look at in the night sky. Uh, and it's best to look at it when there's shadows, when you're at a crescent, because then you get all the shadows on the, the craters and the mountains and things like that. Uh, Venus, while it's cool to look at, is a little bit plain because it's covered in clouds and there's no surface features. Uh, but you can get the phases of Venus. Like right now, we're, we have kind of a shadow on the opposite side of Venus there. Uh, because it is on the inside track of the Sun, as opposed to the other planets are on the outside. Uh, but I also want to show you, if you're going to stay up late enough, uh, wait for the Moon and Venus to... St Whoa! Dang it. <laughs> if you want to accidentally click to the current time and blind yourself with the Sun, uh, let me get back to say, 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night. Looking over to the east, we can see Mars and Saturn are going to start rising tonight. So if you're you're up late enough, you can see uh, five, yeah, five planets tonight with your naked eye. You can see Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, and then Saturn comes up later on. Yeah, about midnight, it's going to be a little bit easier to see, but uh, and obviously, once again, we can simulate what it's looking like through a telescope. You can see the, uh, the different... Uh, Moons of Saturn, Titan, obviously the big one with an atmosphere and oceans of liquid methane. Uh, but this is the way the rings are looking right now. Uh, they're starting the last few years. It's been almost edge on the last 10 years almost. It's been almost edge on. And then uh, right now the rings are starting to, bleh, are starting to open up more. So you can start to see the Cassini division and things like that. Much more interesting to see the rings like that. Uh, Mars is going to be easy to see because it's a big, what looks like a big red star in the sky, but Mars through a telescope, uh, especially when it's as far away as it is, actually it's closer now than it usually is, but uh, uh, it kind of just looks like a bigger red dot. If you have a nice telescope with good seeing, you can start to make out just the, the hazy patch of the polar caps and maybe some dark features like that, but uh, Mars being so small is usually not that amazing to look at, to be quite honest with you. Uh, let me just, because uh, I'm sure you guys are interested, show you a few more things if you are out tonight that you can look at. Let me make it a little bit earlier tonight. Uh, Orion is uh, something that's really cool to look at in the night sky. Let me turn off the constellation lines. Obviously, you got Orion's belt. You got Betelgeuse, the big red giant there. Uh, just below his belt is his sword, and down there is the Orion Nebula, which is a really cool cloud of of gas and dust being illuminated by the newly born stars on the inside. This is something that you can see with binoculars, so I, I su suggest this, and even through telescope is even more amazing from a dark site. Uh, you can see all these clouds. These are, like I said, newborn stars that are being born in there. All this gas and dust is collapsing, uh, and then the wind is kind of creating this trapezium inside there, kind of a bowl shape. Uh, and through the Hubble pictures, this looks really amazing, but through the Hubble pictures, they found that a lot of these stars have protoplanetary disks, disks of dust and gas that's going to condense and turn into planets, much like the, the birth of the solar system, so that's really cool. Uh, a little bit further closer, further closer, a little bit closer to his belt, uh, you can start to see more nebulosity up here, and this is actually where the Horsehead Nebula is. Very dim, very difficult to see unless you're at a really dark sky and you have like an 8-inch or, or bigger telescope. Uh, but the Horsehead Nebula is something I'm sure you guys have seen that Hubble picture. Uh, but that's where all these things are located. Uh, what else do we got? Well, I think the Big Dipper is up, so... Uh, there's the Big Dipper. Obviously, to find the North Star. Does anybody know how to do that? Uh, you got the Big Dipper here. You take these two stars at the end of the dip, <laughs> and then you make a straight line, and this over here is Polaris, the North Star. For those of us, again, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and... Much to contrary belief, the North Star is not the brightest star in the sky. A lot of people falsely believe that for some reason, but uh, it's just a regular old star, double star actually. Uh, but yeah, that's how you find the North Star. Uh, but off of Ursa Major here, we've got these two, the two end handles of the Big Dipper there. Uh, if you look with a telescope at this one, it's actually a double star. 
uh, Mizar and Alcor. It's a cool little double star you can look at. Uh, but there's a few galaxies right around here, and once again, to see galaxies, you got to be in some dark skies, and you got to have a pretty good telescope. Uh, but with these two stars off the handle, let me turn on these again so you can see a little bit better. Off of these two stars in the handle, if you make a right turn at this one and go down to right about here, I'm going to see if I can find this without the label. Oh, there it is. Well, I guess I had the label. Is M51, which is the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, through a telescope is more of a fuzz like this, but uh, yeah, it's actually two galaxies colliding. We got a smaller galaxy kind of elongating the arm of M51 here. Uh, so that's something really cool that's over in the Big Dipper. And then once again with these two handle handlebars, uh, if you make on the opposite side, if you make a equilateral triangle up at this invisible area, as you might have seen, is another galaxy, M101. So there's M101. Uh, even though it's a lot bigger, and the magnitude, if you look at the magnitude here, uh, which I forgot to mention, when you select objects, it gives you the magnitude and a whole bunch of information about the, that object you're looking at. Uh, the magnitude here is 7.7, .7, which is pretty dim on its own, but because M101 is quite big in the sky, it's actually much more diffuse than that. The way they calculate magnitude is they take the entire surface brightness and then condense it down to a point and call that the magnitude. Uh, it's a little bit a little bit wacky that way, but uh, but yeah, that's M101 something cool to see as opposed to if we look at the magnitude of M51 uh, Even though it's a magnitude 8. It's technically dimmer uh, Because it's a much smaller object that that brightness is actually condensed more so it, to the eye and through a telescope It appears slightly brighter uh, and it appears to be a little bit easier to find in my opinion in the night sky with the telescope um, but yeah uh, I think uh, that's kind of the basic stuff I want to touch with in this video. I kind of wanted to give a brief introduction to Stellarium here. Uh, like I said, in the video description is a link to Stellarium.org. You can download it and use it for yourself. It's free, open source. Uh, it's amazing, you know, like much like Firefox and other open, so uh, open source software like that. Um, oh, derp. Uh, off of Andromeda here, uh, we've got the Andromeda Galaxy. Which actually, let me make this sky much darker here. Boo, boo, boo. Get rid of the light pollution. Yeah, I wish I could have these skies. Uh, Andromeda, if you look at the the size, is actually in the night sky bigger than a full moon. Uh, so this is something that you can see with the naked eye at a really dark site. Uh, you can see it with binoculars at a dark site, but uh, the Andromeda galaxy, which obviously we collided together with the Milky Way galaxy in Universe Sandbox. Um, and that's going to happen in, you know, four or five billion years or whatever it is. Uh, that's our, our nearest neighbor. You can go check that out. If you see that in the night sky, these, these photons have been traveling for two million years. That's how far away it is, two million light years. Those photons of light, when you're looking at this, have traveled for two million years, and those few photons that you're getting in your eye uh, have been traveling through space and time for that long just for you to pick them up with your eyeball. So that's <laughs> something that'll make you go, whoa, you know, you'll have a you'll have a Keanu Reeves moment when you look at that. Whoa, it's amazing, man. Uh, but yeah, that's something else. Kind of the major things you can see in the night sky uh, in the coming month or so. Uh, and also, gosh, I'm gonna get lost here. Uh, let me, let me <laughs> see, when I put on the light pollution so low, I get lost because there's too many stars, which is kind of a sad thing to think about, but but yeah, off of Cassiopeia, uh, the big W in the sky, if you follow these two stars straight down a couple uh, a couple ways, you'll see the double cluster, which is a big open cluster of stars, two open clusters of stars, uh, a very good binocular object you can see in the night sky, so, so check that out tonight, and for the next few weeks, actually, you'll be able to see that. Uh, but yeah, what was I getting at? Gosh, I get so lost with this. This is the way I am when I'm out with my telescope. I just, like, I don't, like, sit and concentrate. I'm like, ooh, I gotta look at this. Ooh, I gotta look at that. Uh, but I was getting to, I was saying, this was just a brief, well, a 25-minute brief introduction to Stellarium and the software. Uh, I want you guys to let me know with the, the rating button. Just uh, give a thumbs up, and if I get many, many thumbs ups, thumbs ups? If I get thumbs up enough, I'll, uh, I'll come back maybe, I don't know, what do you think, monthly or so into Stellarium, and I'll give kind of a brief overview of things to look forward to in the night sky. Uh, say, if we keep an eye on Jupiter and we go forward a few days, uh, in the middle of next month, oop, daylight savings, kind of mess things up there. 
uh, around March 13th, 14th, 15th, uh, we can see that Venus and Jupiter, even though the moon goes away, uh, continues on with its orbit. The Jupiter and Venus are going to get really close together uh, for a really aux awesome conjunction uh, in the middle of next month. So if you want me to come back just about every month and give you guys kind of a brief video about what's up in the night sky, let me know. I know it's something that's a little bit a little bit unique to my my gaming Let's Play channel is getting into the science and astronomy software thing. So uh, I think I'd enjoy doing that. It would be a nice refresher for myself to be able to get me to go out and start looking at the sky more than, you know, use all these telescopes that I have that have been collecting dust over the winter here. Uh, but yeah, let me know with a thumbs up if you want me to keep doing that. Uh, feel free to ask me questions in the comments. Uh, feel free to go ahead and download and play around with this software. It's quite excellent. Uh, and yeah, certainly. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. My name is Kurt. I will see you next time.